Top Med Talk. Desiree Chapel here with Top Med Talk. Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, or Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine. Now, in response to the COVID-19 crisis, we have taken action. And in an effort to maintain social distancing as best we can, we have moved to virtual online conferencing. Please join us for our next conference coming up on September 11th through the 13th. It was originally our EBPOM Chicago meeting. It's our EBPOM USA meeting. You can find more information at ebpom.org. That's E-B-P-O-M dot org. Thanks for listening. Well, hello and welcome to Top Med Talk. I'm Desiree Chapel, and I'm joined by my co-host in London, England, Monty Mythen. Hello, Monty. Hey, Desiree. Great to see you. It is great to see you. So you're in London. I'm in Kentucky. Where should we be? <laughs> in San Diego. <laughs> I know. A-A-N-A. Yes. The oh, American yeah. Association, Association of Nurse Anesthetists. We did a show there last year, which was Fantastic, brilliant content out of it, which was in Chicago, and we yeah. were scheduled in a partnership with the AANA to be in San Diego, as I've said uh, in one of the earlier pods from this series from the AANA, mixed emotions about that. Yes. Wouldn't it be great to be in San Diego at the moment, but COVID-19 is complicated, and we saved a lot of carbon by not going. We did. That is a very, <laughs> very fair point, Monty. We talk so yeah. much about the fact that we've had to transition to these virtual conferences and you know, love it or hate it, or kind of, you know, you, like you said, mixed emotions. The one silver line, not one, one of the silver linings is the ability to really reduce our carbon footprint. And that's something that you've been talking about for years, actually. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's quite a lot written about it. It's because the obvious thing is there, but it looks like we're probably going to settle out in the wake of this to go hybrid is the yes. new term. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, travel a lot, long distances a lot less often, but still get together to socialize. So maybe the AANA, I can't say on their behalf, but many conferences next year, you'll be sort of in your region or in your time zone or, but still gathering with others to share experiences. One of the main reasons we've done Top Med Talk is because you and I go to meetings, yeah. but we get to have conversations people wouldn't maybe normally have or would want to have with you know key opinion leaders experts in our field and we get to share that with the world so we you know yeah. everybody doesn't have a travel yeah that's why we started top med talk because we thought these you know wonderful conversations that take place in rooms that might have a few hundred people in it you know top med talks pushing on for its millionth download now which is uh, uh, you know, a relatively close. small number of years more than 100 countries people listening free open access medical education around the world Too and our recent world. you know um online conferences normally we'd have hundreds in the room and this year we had over 8,000 which was great. Moving forward like you said the hybrid idea uh, I think we are all going to be a lot more open to it where there was a lot of resistance before. Yeah and there are other platforms available but I'm kind of zoomed <laughs> I'm kind of zoomed out at this stage I need to yes. get in a room with some other people. Yes I know I know we talk about it a lot. Well Monty like we said before uh, the ANA we've had we had phenomenal conversations a broad array of topics that have just been very popular on Top Med Talk over the last year. Um, last year, we talked about like transgender patients. We talked to some military guys about doing blocks and regional anesthesia in austere environments. We talked to innovators, all kinds of really interesting things. And this year is no different. We have some really, really cool topics. So I would like to introduce our first guest from the ANA 2020 Virtual Annual Congress. He presented or will be presenting, he recorded and will be presenting on Tuesday, uh, taking a closer look at sex, race, and social class disparities in pain. We have Edwin Oroki joining us today on Top Med Talk. Edwin. Hey. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us on Top Med Talk. Um, lovely picture behind you. Where are you coming to us from? I am currently full-time faculty at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in the School of Nursing. I teach primarily in the nurse anesthesia program, but I equally teach across other DNP courses and other PhD students. My focus, being on tenure track, my focus is really research. My research primarily looks at the epigenetic basis of some of the racial disparities that we see in chronic pain. 
And equally, I am a CRNA by training. So I practice every weekend. Every week I go to the UAB main hospital where I still deliver anesthesia and manage that with some teaching. Oh, fantastic. Well, you obviously are not from Birmingham. Um, your accent kind of gives <laughs> it away. So tell us, where you, <laughs> tell us where you're originally from. Yeah, so I was originally born in Cameroon, West Central Africa. I always say we decide whichever suits best, whether it's Central or West Africa. Uh-huh. And that was where I was born. Then came to Birmingham for, by way of Boston. I did my store. I have been quite around, which is one of the things I said with my accent, is where every city I stop at or state, I pick up their accent and modify it to suit mine. <laughs> so I came from Birmingham, from Boston by way of North Carolina, where I did my nurse anesthesia training at Duke, and then practiced at UMass Medical Center for about five years or more, and then came down to Alabama. Oh, fantastic. Well, you're in the presence of another Dukey. Monty spent some time there at Duke. Yeah, I'm an alumnus. I was visiting there in 95, 96 sort of window and joined faculty. And I'm back there as an adjunct professor. So do you support the Blue Devils or? The Blue Devils, yeah. Yeah. Do you? Or is that just <laughs> what you have to blue. say when you're? Because <laughs> you've got a lot, you've been a lot of places. You've got a lot of choices now. So. Uh, no. Once in Duke, you always won. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, they got Good you. answer. Good yeah. answer. So, well, Edwin, we're, we're coming to um, our listeners from the AANA Annual Congress. So it's all virtual. We're all virtual. Uh, but for a lot of listeners out there, they may not understand what the AANA is and, and what being a CRNA is. And, and, you know, most of our listeners know Monty is an anesthesiologist or anesthetist and critical care doc in, in England. And um, I am a CRNA myself, a certified registered nurse anesthetist. Uh, but for our listeners, can you tell us a little bit more about what the AANA is? So the AANA is the Professional Association of Nurse Anesthetists in the United States. So as of last count, we are somewhere around 55,000 nurse anesthetists in the United States, and the ANA is our mother association. Within that, I specifically serve within the Diversity and Inclusion Committee within the ANA. So that is kind of where we sit, and hopefully it would have been, would have been exciting to, for us to all be in San Diego and be screaming up and down, meeting everybody. It's always <laughs> so fun to be there. For the yeah. annual congress. Tell us a little bit about this presentation that you did for the AANA. So one of my main reasons for even choosing this topic was, you know, I came to the realization that, you know, when we go through training, you know, there's a very big emphasis on the biomedical model, right? And I am mm-hmm. guilty of that. Like I just mentioned a few minutes ago, my research is in epigenetics, still going back to that biomedical model and really emphasizing like the pain pathways, you know, the neurons and the snaps and the fibers. But when you really come to think about it, you know, pain is really an experience to the patient. And so there is a whole lot more to it than just the neurons. We all may biologically be very similar or the same, but we all come to experience pain very differently. And now over the years, we've come to realize that, yeah, why pain is something that is universal for all humans, you know, specific populations, i.e. maybe when you look at sex or when you look at ethnic groups or racial differences or when you look at socioeconomic status, you realize that, well, it's not all the same. You know, how do you explain the fact that two patients undergo surgery, one recovers and goes back to baseline and is living their life while the other person develops persistent pain? You know, so that is really what intrigued me. And I felt like, you know, for the CRNA audience, it would be good for us to take a closer look at that and say, what is it that is driving this? Are we really considering all the factors or are we too biomedically focused? Should we really be taking a closer look? Okay, what about the psychological factors? What about sociocultural factors? What about the socioeconomic status? What about the Mm -hmm. patient's own expectations of how much pain they can tolerate? You know, so those are things that I wanted to really dive into. And specifically, I, I think in the, le- in the lecture, I introduced the notion of the biopsychosocial model, which yeah. is really encapsulating all of this. You know, really looking at not just the biological, but the psychological, the social, and the cultural aspects of pain. So, so Edwin, if we can just remind ourselves, for, for me really, of, of some of the basic terminology. We, we all 
uh, we understand nociception. In other words, we've got this sort of neural infrastructure that senses potentially harmful signals and it triggers certain nerve fibers and it goes to, let's call them pain centers, for example. That, that is triggering to create a nervous impulse. But as you've been referring to, pain is what we make of that, the sensation that we feel, how we interpret uh, that stimulus. Therefore, the people talking about different pain thresholds, triggering off the fibers, the, the thresholds are pretty much, let's call them all the same for argument's sake. But what we do with that signal varies quite a lot. Is, is that a reasonable executive summary? That's the distinguishing that the pain accurate. bit. With, yeah. That is very accurate. And that is one of the reasons why not very long ago, the International Association for the Study of Pain came up with it and even revised definition of pain. Okay. That way, capturing that emotional aspect. Mm. We now acknowledge that pain. So for instance, an unconscious patient, right? Like for us, CRNAs and anesthesia providers, when the patient is unconscious, well, there's the perceived pain. We see changes yes. in the vital signs telling us that there is pain transmission and pain perception going on. So that emotional aspect of it. So just because somebody could not express pain, right, doesn't mean that they cannot feel pain. Mm -hmm. And that revised definition really captures that word. And one more piece of revision, because I think it all potentially does come into it, even though it's going back to some of the basic science. The epigenetics, I think we all understand genetics. In other words, you know, the genetic code that it fingerprints what we become. But the epi bit, what, what's the epi bit in the epigenetics? So the epi base is, epi comes from the word beyond, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea really being that, you know, for instance, if you have two identical twins at birth, mm -hmm. okay, they have an identical genome. So their yeah. genetic is the same. But now as they go through life, environmental factors now influence which of those genes are turned on or turned off. And that is really the basis of epigenetics. You know, where we want to really see, okay, what has, okay, your environmental, and when we talk of environment, it's really not just external. It could be mm -hmm. internal environment as well. So for instance, if you have an identical twin, one of them undergoes chemotherapy, for instance, right? We know that phenotypically, they will lose their hair, you know, they will, their physical appearance is going to change. That is a very classic example of an epigenetic change. And similarly, okay. we equally see maybe like patients who are alcoholics. We all have seen that in the OR where somebody who has drunk for quite a while may appear in terms of their phenotype, how they look, older than they are. That is an epigenetic change because that environmental exposure has regulated which gene is turned on and which gene is actually turned off. And it's because if I'm right, I, we don't use that much of our total genetic code. So there's a lot to spare. That is and, correct. And as I've understood, the thing that's happened more recently in the science is how quickly you can turn bits on and turn bits yeah. off with yeah. exercise, diet, alcohol, drugs, emotions. And that's the, with things like uh, methylation, for example, of the various different bits of the genetic code and, I've even seen some cool bits of science where someone's, you know, being pushed hard in the gym and you can, you can, you know, almost uh, see with certain techniques that the code being switched on and switched off. Very, very yeah. challenging stuff. I mean, definitely, I mean, the methylation, which you mentioned, is one of the most studied epigenetic change. And there is a group, Susan Dorsey, out of out the University of Maryland, they have looked at exercise mm. and its effect on chronic lower back pain and seeing whether does exercise induce epigenetic changes as one of the beneficiaries, kind of like the underlying mechanism by which exercise helps with chronic lower back pain. So there is definitely, and that to me was one of my draws into epigenetics, the fact that you can induce, the environment can induce these changes, but they are reversible. Mm. You know, even though it can be passed on from generation to generation, it, actually reversible it's not static similar to like a genome with genome I, when i did my first study it was on pharmacogenetics and i always say okay if i tell you you have this gene so what can you really do about it <laughs> you know there's very limited other than me telling you well avoid this drug or avoid that one but with the epigenetics i feel like we can start working on some of those okay how can we reverse some of these environmentally induced changes so yeah. another way of looking at it is there's always hope you can't just yes. <laughs> Your cards you were dealt, get over it. 
you can you can you know yeah. you can do something about it i'm gonna tell my mom that whenever she says oh it's all <laughs> <laughs> um no well yeah. edwin talk to us a little bit more i mean this is absolutely a fascinating subject and um you know you think about your patients that you have coming out you think you've hit the mark on their pain and you know you did the same thing you did for the last one and it worked beautifully and then you know it, this is an intro of course and and then post op they come out and you're like what just happened like everything looked great and now they're they're saying they have a pain score of 10 to me it's just a difference in patient you know i mean it doesn't necessarily mean you know, I, I'm not looking at their socioeconomic class or race or anything like that. It's just a difference in patients. But you're saying that we, it can dive a little bit deeper. Is that correct? Yes. And I think one thing that we as providers, so that is a problem that you can look at from different perspectives. So you have patient factors. Then we have our own judgment as providers. And we have all the environmental stuff, right? So if you look at it from the patient's perspective, one fundamental thing that may be driving that may just be the fact that that patient, what is their prior exposure to maybe the opioids you are using, right? What is, what, what is their experience or what are their expectations of that pain control? And I always give the example of somebody living in cold weather versus warm weather. So if I ask somebody who has never been out of Birmingham, Alabama, well, how cold it is, their reference may be a freezer, right? Because they haven't experienced the cold vortex of Chicago. <laughs> you know, so when they are telling you it's five out of 10, that five out of 10 may not necessarily be your five out of 10 or his five, or Monty's five out of 10. So initially, I think that is really where providers have to start by establishing that baseline for the patient. What is a reasonable pain threshold? What is a reasonable pain goal as we go to treat your pain what should be our reasonable expectation? Are we try, striving for a zero out of 10 or are we striving for a five out of 10? Once you establish that, then you can now start looking at, okay, what are other issues that the patient has? Do they have any comorbid factors? Do they have chronic pain as a baseline? Are they already exposed to opioids? Are they on other, on other drugs which can interact with the medications we are going to administer? But now going back further into really the mid of my talk, it's really looking at, well, now we, once we feel that like once we have accounted for those things, then we realize that well, there are some general trends within different populations where we see that, hey, women overall, you know, females tend to report more pain than males. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we really don't know. One, at the individual level, again, could it just be because of the fluctuations of hormones? Mm -hmm. We have seen studies shown that, hey, when you measure pain, depending on what phase in the menstrual cycle yeah. the female is in, yeah. you have different sensitivity to pain, especially in, exper in experimentally induced pain. And we equally know that most of these pain differences that we see, once women menopause they start leveling off. So it means that the hormones are playing a role, but we don't quite know specifically yet. You know, mm -hmm. we know that on the male side, testosterone plays a big role in you know cognition and how they behave, and just our you know societal perception of manliness. Yeah. Right. So, what does that really mean to the patient? Does that mean that if you ask a male patient how much pain they are in, they are more likely to not even tell you the truth because they think it's unmanly to be a wimpy? You know. Oh, they're going to be our first right and tell you. Yeah. No? So those are some of the sex differences that you begin to tease out again at the patient level. Yeah. I would have said women have a higher pain tolerance than men just because of the whole having babies thing. But that would, you know, that's... <laughs> just... <laughs> that has been something that has been, you know, it's been investigated quite a bit. And I think that, that was my bias view too. I always felt like women could yeah. tolerate pain more than men. But I think what happens is when you look at prevalence, for instance, there you see that across multiple chronic pain conditions, women tend to report higher prevalence mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. And I think that is where the difference comes in. And I, again, it goes back to, is it a biological, i.e. hormonal, yeah. you know, inflammatory, inflammatory cytokines and things like that? Or is it just the fact that women just take better care of themselves, right? I mean, I would say in my household, I go to the hospital when my wife tells me, you have to go. 
It's not because I necessarily think I'm, I'm supposed to go, but she's like, hey, you have to go. I'm like, okay, I will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In some, parts of, some parts of the UK, men go to the hospital when the ambulance arrives. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a really interesting to think about because, you know, you can kind of explain, you know, it's almost explaining away, you know, this difference in gender because of hormones or whatever else. But what I found especially interesting was the fact that you brought up race and social class, like economic, um, you know, socioeconomic differences. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So race and social class, especially here in the U.S., are things which it's very difficult to separate, right? I mean, actually, some investigators have said you cannot truly understand race without considering social class. Mm -hmm. And one best way to really understand the race difference and the effect of race on pain is, is really informed by this idea of the minority stress theory. And basically where that comes from is the idea that for racial minorities, especially Blacks, they are exposed to chronic stress, the stress of daily you know, racism where, okay, maybe going to the store and being looked differently. Of late in the news, we all have heard about the yeah. encounters with the police, having the talk with your, with, with your son and things like that. That chronic stress, right, causes dysregulation in the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So basically, it's kind of like living at a perpetual state of chronic stress. Well, naturally, if you are exposed to high levels of cortisol over time, the body is going to adapt. And one of the current hypotheses is that that induces inflammatory changes and dysregulation in the autonomic nervous system, which may now lead now to a heightened state. So kind of like a perpetual state of alertness. And that may be what is driving some of the racial differences that we see in chronic pain. Again, that is one theory. On the other hand, you may equally be, when you think of racial differences, and you think about the patient provider encounter, you know, historically you've had situations where blacks, for instance, may not necessarily feel that the provider trusts them. So there is that possibility of that imbalance one, you know, they do not trust each other. So how much of the pain are they reporting? Do they wait until the pain is so bad, then show up as I now when we are measuring it, it's more severe. But unfortunately, at the later stage, we have seen that as a problem across multiple chronic conditions, including even cancer, where racial minorities will show up when it's really bad, not when something could have been done about it. So there is that idea of lack of trust within the system, where they do not even trust the system. And it becomes a big problem for us anesthesia providers. When they show up to the OR, you are doing your best. You want to take care of them. But now if the patient laying there is not trusting you, we know that rapport is very critical in outcomes. Mm -hmm. And it's not just in pain outcomes, but every heart I care outcome. You need the patient to trust that you will have their best interest at heart. And mm -hmm. equally, you have to equally be going into it feeling like the patient trusts you. So if that trust is broken because of historical factors, that is one of the main drivers. So Edwin, on the, on the chronic stress uh, theory and, and maybe it's more than a theory which is the purpose of my question that relates to the grumbling stress component of it that relates to race is there are there epidemiological signals to suggest the fact that this is less of a problem in more racially tolerant yeah. counties regions parts of the country you know wh wherever we are you know uh, 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 i take london as an example we think we're much more racially integrated and that there may be less chronic stress levels in London. I might be right, I might be wrong. There are certainly other parts of the countries where you get the impression that you might be part of everyday life being stressed about having a different coloured skin. Are there, is there, are there studies that support that hypothesis? Yes, and that is where the whole idea of you cannot really study race without mm. consideration of somebody's socioeconomic Social status, status comes yeah. from. The idea that somebody who lives in a more violent neighborhood, right, mm. who is more exposed to daily violence, yeah. has they tend to report higher levels of pain. Yes. And that is and that correlates with higher levels of daily stress. Yeah. So that is definitely a factor. But one thing that I mean, as we think about our current environment, COVID nineteen has kind of 
throw the wrench into everything we thought we knew, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> because that is something that I've been thinking quite a bit about too, because some of the studies coming out seem to be saying that, well, you know, I, I specifically thinking about the study out of MIT, where they were lo looking at racial differences and disparities in COVID-19. And they said, well, race alone is just an independent predictor by itself. Mm. Mm. So even when you account for socioeconomic status, race be, stood it by itself. So that to me really got my attention because I was like, well, I guess if we are saying, let's dissociate socioeconomic status, and just look at race and it becomes, it, it remains a predictor, mm -hmm. means there must be something else. And it, that again, it goes back to where I said my research really grounds itself. Could it be that some of these changes have already happened and are now already being passed on from generation to generation such that we now have to basically do interventions, mm -hmm. you know, to reverse those changes, i.e. some of the epigenetic changes that I was saying, because, <laughs> We see that. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Edwin, uh, my, my uh, understanding of some of the early work with regards to how susceptible was to COVID-19, it actually looked as though some of that was actually genetic as opposed to the compounding issues of epigenetic. You know, the, the susceptibility to the access of COVID-19 via certain receptors is racially different at a genetic level, which is challenging as well. So very complicated. Yeah. 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 So that I think that is why I say COVID has come to really, it's mm. thrown a wrench into everything we thought we knew. And I think as investigators, we all are now taking a step back to say, okay, what do we know? What do we truly not know? And how do we go back and really rethink about some of the hypotheses which have been in, you know, supporting our science and the way science is driven. Yeah, absolutely. And the two overlap, Desiree, the two overlap in a very, very tangible way for people can see it. You know, if yeah. you're, it would appear to be that if you're white and wealthy, you're relatively protected. But if you're white, wealthy, self-abusive, obese and inactive, <laughs> then the epigenetic component has negated much of the genetic advantage. Yeah. And we see that in some very famous people uh, j just down the road from where I appear to be sitting in London at the moment were a, a, a classical example of that. They had all the opportunity to not suffer from COVID-19, but they overwhelmed it with epigenetic components. I wonder though, as CRNAs, as anesthesia providers, how do we use this information? How is this gonna change my practice tomorrow? How is this gonna change your practice tomorrow? I think one thing is, which I didn't mention is the role of the provider, right? So mm -hmm. what, do, what is our own contribution to this, right? Because we cannot be the drivers of the ship and all of this is happening within us. And we say, well, it's only the passengers. No, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> we, we must have some level of contribution to whatever is going on. I think you've probably heard this thrown out quite a bit, implicit bias and all of that. Mm -hmm. I think as providers, that is really where we have to own it and say, well, implicit bias is something that all of us have. Okay, it's not, it's part of human nature. I mean, if you, just, if you just think about what, when you are stressed out, right, mm -hmm. and you are under intense pressure, you are more likely to default to innate actions, right? You act without even thinking. You start doing mm -hmm. things that you've done most routinely, which is why for us anesthesia providers, we say, do it for every skill we want to do, do it so many times that you can do it in your sleep, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, not like, so that is really what implicit bias kind of is. Those are the unconscious things that have been ingrained in our mind. So now when we are under intense stress, right? And if somebody tells you that, oh, they have a pain of eight out of 10, unconsciously, you may be saying, hmm, is this truly an eight? Yeah. I don't really think about they it. They don't look like they're an eight. They look like they're a five. They have an eight. <laughs> yeah. And what, do, uh, what are you going to treat? you mm -hmm. will treat your interpretation of the mm -hmm. pain that they are telling you. You will not treat necessarily what they are telling you, right? Mm -hmm. And that has been brought up in this lens theory, which is basically to treat pain, we look at, we take cues, we look at the heart rate, we look at the respiratory rate, look at their demeanor, and then they give you a number. Well, that number is only interpreted within those other cues. And that, and you are, you know, outcome and how your intervention is going to now be based on 
that composite score, your ungenerated composite score, that is one thing that we all can do. Start saying, hey, if a patient says it's eight, before I think it's not an eight, let me really take a step back. Why do I truly think it's not an eight? What is informing that decision? Because the, the risk there is of your conscious bias or unconscious bias mixed in with that. But So to try and make that more objective, we've done a few interviews over the last year about um, nociceptive monitoring, the idea mm -hmm. of you know, using monitoring techniques that look at physiological variables to give you a number that suggests the fact that you are experiencing pain, which adds yep. another complexity to it. Machine says no, you say yes. You know, some of these are approved in Europe now. I don't think any are approved by the FDA in the USA. So now you can say, well, you can tell me it hurts as much as you want, but the computer says no. How are we get, what are we no. going to do with that? <laughs> That'll be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Mm, I'm sorry. Computer says no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think that is really where things are going. And kind of in line with that, Monty, is equally the whole notion of preoperative quantitative centric testing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where we want to be able to preoperatively test how sensitive you are to pain so that we can predict. Well, what, how much of that do we really, you know, do we buy into? You know, as providers, we want the latest and the greatest knowledge out there, the best evidence to take care of our patient. One of the things you said, you know, having that the sensitivity screening kind of before, but are there any validated tools that kind of look at some of the points that may allude to the fact that the patient may in have increased pain, you know, post-operatively. So you said, you know, if they've had prior exposure to opioids, you know, all these different things, are there any validated screening tools that we could perhaps use to inform the way that we treat our patient's pain? There are several tools which look at general pain. Very few have really focused on preoperative assessment as mm -hmm. a predictor of post-op pain. And the real reason being, one, during the preoperative phase, acute pain is something that is very different, both at the physiologic and control level from chronic pain, right? So as much as we want to be able to predict acute pain, it is innately challenging. The closest I know of are studies looking at using quantitative sensory testing. The idea being you want to induce a stimuli that you can control for. Because again, going back to tools, one of the biggest critique of measurement tools has been the fact that they're all subjective. So you are using a subjective tool to you know, predict an objective outcome. That for scientists, you know, somebody who is a pure you know, believer in objective science will tell you where well, that is really not true. You should use objective measures to predict objective outcomes. You yeah. can't use a subjective measure to predict an, an objective outcome. So for now, the main answer is not that I know of. I don't really know of any good measure at this point that we can use to predict. But we know, like I said, if you like, and you, you've concurred a few minutes ago, there are a few things that as providers, we have to always be alert for. Does the patient have any history of prior exposure to opioids? Does the patient have underlying chronic pain? Okay, does the patient have any other comorbidity? So for instance, uh, mood disorders, anxiety, mm -hmm. depression, right? Those are things which have been shown to be all catastrophizing, right? Those are things which have been shown to be strong predictors of more severe and disabling pain. And, and, and Edward, is there any mileage at all in asking somebody if where they think they're pain threshold is i know that's a very unscientific thing to say <laughs> but i mean if 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 i was asked i might be wrong i would say that my pain threshold is you know moderate to high because i played a lot of physical contact sports and maybe preconditioned myself to the joy of pain but uh, or maybe i didn't but is there is there any mile and other people my some of my relatives would tell me that you know that they, they're um have very very low pain thresholds in other words any little thing hurts a lot is, is that a crazy thing to ask? No, I think it's, it's a valid assessment. And I would say you, you piggyback that, especially if you are talking to a patient pre-op, what level of pain is acceptable for you? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. If you add those two, that gives you a pretty good idea. Because this way, you, you may equally appreciate this more. Because I remember when, when I used to do OB anesthesia, mm. you mm. walk into the room where the nurse is telling the patient, you, oh, once they do uh, place your epidural, you will feel no pain. 
I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that is not the idea. <laughs> All right. The idea isn't that you will not feel pain. Is that you, we're going to make it bearable. We're going to make it so that you can still yeah. tolerate it. What yeah. level of pain is acceptable? Yeah. yeah. And you wait till you wait till they're thirteen or fourteen. They can always <laughs> hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. The kiddos do that. Well, Edwin, um, I, this conversation is fantastic. Thank you so much for shedding Brilliant. light on yeah. to this topic that, you know, honestly, I've probably never thought of. And many of us as anesthesia providers probably don't think of on a daily basis taking care of patients, you know, case after case after case. So yeah. it gives us food for thought for sure. Um, thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing, um, teaching our future generations of nurses and CRNAs. That's fantastic. Thank you for all yeah. that work. No, thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. This is a, a topic I'm very passionate about and, you know, it's exciting. Yeah, you can tell. I love it. It's whenever that passion is palpable, it's great. Well, thank you so much for listening to Top Med Talk. You know you can always find us on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and find us at topmedtalk.com. You can get our daily podcast there. You can subscribe and find us on your favorite podcatcher. Um, we really appreciate you listening. We're so excited to be um, supported by the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists this year for their 2020 annual virtual Congress. And uh, we hope to have many more amazing conversations at this, as the days go on. So stay tuned. Thanks so much for listening. Cheers. Bye. Top Med Talk. Nick McGerrison here. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioptive medicine. EBPOM has been advocating perioptive medicine for many years now, using the traditional conference circuit, where people have attended meetings from all over the world and heard some of the latest information. However, in the face of the COVID crisis, EBPOM took a bold decision. We've transposed the entire conferencing experience into an online experience. Carbon-friendly conferencing. The latest information, the latest talks, the hottest experts, the most incisive analysis, and even the socializing. We've got it all covered as EBPOM goes virtual. Hot on the heels of the huge success of EBPOM 2020 live from London, we're now headed towards EBPOM Chicago. Come aboard and be part of one of the most exciting developments in medicine since the stethoscope. EBPOM Chicago. Get yourself to epom.org now and guarantee yourself a place at one of the most exciting conferences in the world.